Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh and welcome to an all new Ace in a Day gameplay for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In today's episode I shall be reviewing the RE 2001 Serie 1, a tier 2 battery rating 2.3 Italian fighter. As always, starting with the plane's history, we shall be covering the Reggiani RE 2001 from its inception through to the Serie 1 variant. We begin thus. When Reggiani's RE2000 Falco, or Falcon 1 fighter design was rejected by the Reggia Aeronautica, the Italian Royal Air Force, in late 1939, one of the main reasons for the design's rejection was its 986 horsepower Piaggio P9 radial engine. The engine was perceived to be limiting the aircraft's performance, especially with the arrival of the German Daimler Benz DB601 AA inline engine in 1939. In response, Reggiani set about developing an improved fighter design that would capitalise on the greater performance offered by a DB601 engine as produced under licence by Alfa Romeo as the RA1000 RC41 Mark IA Monsone or Monsoon, with a power output of 1,175 horsepower. Designated as the RE2001 Falco II, the rest of the improved fighter's design was based heavily on its predecessor, seeing the RE2000 fuselage structure being adapted to accommodate the new inline engine and both its tail unit and semi-elliptical wing being retained. In terms of armament, the RE2000's armament of two nose-mounted 12.7mm Brita Safat machine guns would be kept and enhanced with two 7.7mm Brita Safat machine guns as mounted in the wings. With its initial prototype flying for the first time on the 14th of July 1940 and undergoing further trials at the Regia Aeronautical Testing Facility in Guidonia, or soon after, the RE2001 immediately declared its potency. Able to achieve a top speed of 568 km an hour or 353 miles per hour at 5,486 meters or 18,000 feet altitude and show maneuverability that was on par with the British Supermarine Spitfire, the RE2001 was awarded with a production order for 300 aircraft as of the 31st of October 1940. However, the transition of the RE2001 from design to production aircraft was delayed due to two main reasons. Firstly, on the 10th of August 1940, Aeronautica Maquis MC202 fighter design flew for the first time and reached a top speed of 603 km an hour or 375 miles per hour at 5486 meters or 18000 feet altitude from using the same RA1000 RC41 Mark 1A inline engine. On top of the MC202 being faster than the RE2001, it was found that the two planes were closely matched in terms of maneuverability. As a result, the MC202 took priority in production the available RA1000 engines being allocated to the MC202. Secondly, Regia Aeronautica objected to the fact that the RE2001's wing fuel tanks had been built into the wing. This was one of the reasons for the RE2000's rejection as it was believed that these fuel tanks would be vulnerable, prone to leaks and difficult to manufacture. Instead, Regia Aeronautica requested that the wing be redesigned to accommodate more conventional armoured fuel tanks. It took Reggiani the rest of 1940 to redesign the RE2001's wing with a second prototype starting test flights as of December 1940. These two factors meant the first production aircraft only started being delivered in June of 1941 under the designation of RE2001 Serie 1, the plane seen on screen today. A total of 40 were produced by the end of 1941, with the Serie 1 entering service as December that year. Seeing combat over Malta against the British Royal Air Force's Spitfire Mark Vs from May 1942 onwards, the Sea ones acquitted themselves well, holding their own at altitudes below 7,000 metres or 22,966 feet, where the Spitfire's speed advantage was less prominent. In all, a total of 100 Sea ones were produced, with the Sea one gradually being replaced on the production lines over the course of 1942 by the RE2001 CB fighter bomber variant, which we shall cover in a future review. And so, with our historical review concluded, let us take a look at how the RE2001 Serie 1 handles in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. Today's gameplay is brought to you from the frontline map African Canyon. For this we'll be using the following setup. Stealth belts are both calipers and machine gun, reasoning being the same in both cases, that in my experience the stealth belts offer the greatest damage output over time. Our gun convergence is set to 300 meters, noting it only affects our 7.7 meter machine guns as mounted in the wings, and the reason for this is twofold. Firstly, we're going to be trying to use the RE2001 C1 in a turn fighting stance wherever possible, and therefore we're going to be going up against foes at engagement distances of 200 to 400 meters. So 300 meters being right in the middle of that range is going to be the ideal convergence setting. And secondly, 
In my experience, the maximum effective range of the 7.7 litre British Fat Machine Gun is no greater than 600 metres, at which point you not only have to provide lead on the target, but you also have to account for vertical drop on the rounds due to gravitational forces, meaning you have to drop the rounds onto target, which can lead to frustration and unreliable results at distances in excess of 600 metres. As for our fuel load, we are taking the standard fuel load of 30 minutes to ensure we can make it to the end of the game, unscathed on fuel capacity. Now as always, starting off with the plane's climb performance, we can see that the climb rate of the RE2001 C1 is phenomenal for its battle rating, and amongst the best at its battle rating in the race to 5000 meters. Coming in amongst the likes of the Key 44 Mark 1, the MC202 and the VG33 C1. When using a climb angle of up to 22.5 degrees and more emergency power cycling, you'll be able to get all the way out from your starting spawn altitude of 2,500 meters to 5,500 meters in a single climb before you'll need to consider leveling out and building up your speed before going again. And that's because at 5,500 meters altitude, you'll be hitting the maximum altitude limit for your engine where your power begins to drop off and your acceleration in a straight line and your climb rate are both affected. Meanwhile, in terms of your control surfaces, the maximum altitude limit is 5,000 meters, at which point heaviness is added to the elevator of the plane, causing the turn circle to start to widen and becomes even more noticeable above 6,000 meters. So already we can see that the ideal altitude range of this plane is going to be below 5,000 meters, and it is anywhere from ground level to 4,500 meters in my experience. But before we elaborate on that, note how we're charging after this AR2 right now, and we're trying to use the RE2001 Siri 1 as a secondary interceptor. Now to emphasize here the concept of secondary or a backup interceptor. If we were playing as the top battery rating aircraft, we could use this plane as an interceptor because we'd be typically facing mono-engined bombers such as the SBD-3 Dauntless or the B5N2 and also be seeing the likes of the PBY-5 Catalina. But all these bombers have one thing in common. They are slow and on top of that, some of them are incredibly weak, particularly the single-engine bombers. But in the case of the PBY-5 Catalina, it's also got the rather exposed cockpit that we can aim at from a head-on off center pass. So coming in slightly on the beam, aim for that cockpit, kill the crew inside the cockpit, and that bomber's rendered obsolete. The difficulty is, as we go up against higher battery rating bombers, our fires are typically more alert to our incoming presence, they've got the speed to be able to dive away and sponge up a good amount of fire from our machine guns, because we're lacking the ability to deal considerable damage in a short period of time thanks to our armament, whereas the F4U-1A Corsair, which dove down on the SB2M we originally went for and then finished off the AR2, which we achieved the critical hit on, their 650 caliber machine guns possess the greater burst mass and the ability to bring down a bomber in a single pass. If we had 20mm cannon, the effect would be the same, i.e. we would have the firepower to bring the foe down in that singular pass. And this extends into boom and zoom, such as the Messerschmitt 110C7 there. We lack the ability to simply wipe a foe from the sky in a very short period of time. Instead, we have to deal sustained damage over time to bring them down. And whilst this plane does have great boom and zoom potential, it just lacks the firepower to back it up. When you go to lower and lower altitudes and you start to get into that ground level to 4,500 meter altitude range, and you go for turn fighting in particular, you really start to shine, because you mitigate that lack of time on target. You set your foes up to give you maximum time on target, to put them in a position where they cannot escape your gunfire anymore. And we're seeing the last remnants of our frustration here against the AR-2, snapping onto the SM-79, and then we'll be snapping back to that AR-2. Now what makes the RE2001 Siri 1 such a strong turn fighter? Well, it's a combination of two assets. Number one, it's turn circle, and number two, it's great energy retention in both the vertical and the horizontal. And you'll see in the latter right now as we snap onto the AR2. But let's talk about that turn circle firstly. The turn circle of this plane is retained from the preceding RE2000 Siri 1, a review of which is available for you to view using the link in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now. You have a turn circle which is the equivalent of the likes of the MB152C1, the Key 61 Mark I Koenotsu, and it's just slightly behind the likes of the Spitfire Mark IA, and more so the I-16 Type 24 and the Hurricane Mark IIb, and then the best turner within your battery rating range, the A6M 2-M. What this means is you have great natural turn fighting capability because you can outturn most foes. If you get rid of your combat flaps and just fly this plane with no flaps active, your turn circle is as strong as your couple of Yak-1Bs or Yak-7s. This means in turn, you have the ability to outturn a good number of foes simply by not using your flaps. Then adding the flaps, the picture only gets better, adding your landing flaps and your turn circle gets even tighter and you can really take the fights to the foes such as the Spitfire Mark 1A and even the Hurricane that I mentioned. But add to this the fact that your horizontal energy retention gives you the capability to feel so comfortable in turn fighting. 
With no flaps active, what you'll find is you'll be able to hold your speed in a dedicated turn at the 395 km an hour mark, which is exceptional for the batter rating. Put the combat flaps on, this threshold drops to 305 km an hour, which is still fantastic and means you're still well within the fight. Add the landing flaps and this threshold drops to 230 km an hour. And you may be thinking at this point, well isn't that dangerous because you start to experience heaviness on the elevator, store effects, etc. Well to agree, a degree, yes, but not massively. Below 250 km an hour you'll find that the elevator of this plane starts to become heavier. However, only going below 190 km an hour is going to trigger store effects in this plane, which means you can use your landing flaps for an extended period of time to remain competitive in the tight distance turn fights if you want to go after the likes of the I-16 Type 24. And it's only if you really start to abuse your landing flaps that you're going to have the difficulty and bleed enough energy to put yourself more towards your store effects coming at that 190 km an hour mark. But outside this you also have vertical energy retention to consider and we're going to demonstrate that in latching up after this key 61 Mark 1 go. Note how we can just go vertical after them as they've been damaged in our Sunderland Mark 3. Now they're oblivious to our presence currently but the point here is that we've been able to literally go dead vertical, use more emergency power to supplement our engine power and just charge after them and now we're going to close the distance and force them into a turn fight as they finish off our Sunderland. The vertical energy retention of the RE2001 Series 1 is such, and this comes back to the boom and zoom concept, that if I start off at an altitude of 4000 meters and a speed of 300 km an hour, and go into a dive over 1550 meters before using a return angle of 30 degrees, I can get back to my starting state with this plane on engine power alone. Throw more emergency power, and this threshold goes up to 2300 meters. What does this mean in terms of the turn flight? Well, apart from what you saw there against the Key 61 Mark 1 Co, it means that tactics such as a climbing spiral in order to shake off a foe who's close on your 6 with a tighter turn circle but not a strong energy retention in the horizontal and the vertical is going to be very easy to deploy. And in return when foes try to use that against you, the likes of say the Heinkel 100D1, which is a very powerful tool for that aircraft, you can exploit this energy retention in order to counter that, meaning that you are a very difficult plane to force to stall out in the midst of a turn fight, and you retain so much performance even as you're going down to the lower speeds. Now your stall speed is 120 km an hour, which is average for your batter rating, but you're rarely going to see it unless you force yourself into a stall. And even then, your stall recovery is strong, in that your nose will drop gradually and your speed only needs to build to 195 km an hour before you regain the control surfaces and the plane is going to lose minimal altitude in doing so no more than 25 meters altitude if you conduct the stall below 4000 meters altitude which again means stalls are painless and this plane is just going to be able to be an absolute nuisance that nobody can get to stall out unless they force you into say a 90 degree climb and we latch onto the back of our Messerschmitt 19 ML3 here and we're going to stay tight on their 6 to demonstrate the turn fighting capabilities once again and the confidence we can fight with. And the reason we're so strong here despite our firepower is because in the end we can set off up to give ourselves ample time on target and accurate time on target to tear them apart. Right now we haven't got the cleanest of shots on the Messerschmitt 109 but eventually they're going to make the mistake, they're going to give us enough time on target and when they do we're ready to tear them apart. And this is where the accuracy is demanded because we once we get that one clear burst on target it'll be enough to rip them out of the sky for another kill. And that's our ace in the day right there. Now outside of the energy retention in the horizontal and the vertical what do you need to consider as a weakness? Well the straight line energy retention of this plane is actually a worrying factor. Now it's average for its batter rating in that if you come out of an extreme dive, level out the plane at 500 meters altitude and fly in a straight line, you'll be holding your speed at the 495 km an hour mark. Now when you're the top batter rating aircraft, this isn't exactly a problem. It's when you're facing like flight batter rating aircraft and higher batter rating aircraft that you start to experience the worrying concerns. In that you will not be able to run away from foes such as an F4U-18 Corsair, a Typhoon Mark 1A, etc. And instead you are forced to engage those foes. And if you find yourself trying to run away in the midst of the enemy team's zone, so well within their territory, this means that you're going to have to go into a turn fight and encounter perhaps a many versus one where you are the one. So in a way you are baited, if you will, into these situations where you're forced to turn fight against foes who you may not have wanted to choose to turn fight against, but you simply can't because as you're flying away they're getting closer and closer, but they're maintaining a distance where they can get shots on target, and if you just fly in a straight line you're going to get torn to pieces, so you need to take evasive action and turn the tables against them. Now we have taken some damage, and this is on a completely unrelated note, for some ground based flak, and we can see that we've taken a light amount of damage, and this brings us on to the durability of the plane, which we're going to also elaborate on through the format of attacking this Breda 88. Now the durability of the RE2001 Series 1 is decent, in that this plane can take multiple hits from machine guns of multiple calibers, and it also can take some 20mm cannon fire. 
But the problem is, you'll feel confident in being able to take this fire, and when going after enemy bombers, you'll think that this is your ability to mitigate your lack of damage output from your machine guns, you can just stay on the foe six and keep ripping into them. Which you're seeing here, I'm making that mistake, and I've now taken a lot of damage to the engine because of the accurate fire of the return machine gun. And I'm going to continue to do this, and I will eventually get the kill on the bread at 88. But in return, I've crippled my aircraft, my pilot's severely wounded. And though the fact I've still got full control of the plane despite my pilot going red, it's recently changed by the sounds of things on the War Thunder servers, so that the pilot wounding mechanic and its net effect on the performance of your aircraft is no longer a significant factor, if a factor at all, in Air Arcade. I'm not sure about the other air battle modes, but we're not seeing it here. It means now we're in a crippled state, and when your engine goes orange you'll find you'll lose 50% of your engine performance as we dodge the majority of the incoming fire from the equivalent of the Yak-7B, but see how we can absorb the incoming fire, glancing fire there, we're still able to hold on and just stay on their 6. And if only we had a little bit more engine power here, if we didn't have all the damage to our engine, we would have had a clean shot on target there and it could have been a critical hit if not another kill to add to our tally. But instead we're going to have to use our rudder to turn home and get back to base. Now as we make our way back, let's talk about the control surfaces of this plane, because we made a big point about the plane's turn circle, but what about the free control axes? Well the weakest one is in terms of your roll rate or your ailerons, in that it's average at best for the battle rating. And in a high speed dive you'll find between 700 and 800 km an hour, the performance will drop off by 25%. It's not too noticeable, and that factor is because of your average dive speed acceleration, in that you'll go from a speed of say 300 km now to 750 km now at an average rate in a sharp dive, but then there is a massive drop off making it very difficult to get above 800 km now in the dive, let alone reach your maximum dive speed of 903 km now, which is great for your battery rating, but you're rarely going to see it. Therefore, this issue with the roll rate locking up in a high speed dive is not too prominent one because it takes so long to get to the lock up threshold in the first instance. Whereas looking at the other control surfaces, you have your rudder, which is strong, and it gives you a tight flat rudder turn circle, comparable to the Spitfire Mark 1A's rudder, and between 600 and 700 km an hour on a high speed dive, you'll find it will drop by 50%. But most importantly, the strongest control surface by far is the elevator of this plane, where you'll find that you have a very tight loop circle, unlike the P-36C and G-Hawks that you're going to be encountering, and you only need to be at a speed of 230 km an hour if you're flying at say 2000 meters altitude in order to complete a loop. This is one of the lowest looping speed thresholds for a monoplane fighter at, around, at and around the battery rate in a 2.3, giving you the ability to continue to conduct loops at the lowest possible speed and frustrate foes by forcing them to follow you into a loop and stalling out in your wake. In terms of high speed maneuverability, what you'll find is in a dive between 550 and 600 km an hour, there's a drop off of 25% on the initial response to the elevator in both positive and negative G axes. I mean that the initial response will take a little bit more time, but it's not too noticeable to the point it's going to impact your ability to fly the plane or blow out to the dive at the last minute. So you can feel rather comfortable when conducting those boom and zoom strikes. But again, the limitation factor, as mentioned previously with Boom and Zoom, is the fact you lack the firepower to go with the flavour of this plane and being strong in a Boom and Zoom strike. Now outside of dive acceleration and maximum dive speeds, what about straight line acceleration as we go to take off now and find other targets? Well, this plane accelerates very well from its stall speed of 120 km an hour all the way up to 350 km an hour. Then there is a gradual drop off. Meanwhile, with War Emergency Power Active, you'll find that you'll accelerate all the way up to 420 km an hour at a very fast rate, and then there is a major drop off in acceleration. And that's one thing to keep in mind with this plane. You will have difficulty in getting this plane speed in a straight line above 475 km an hour, and particularly more so 500 km an hour. And this comes back to that initial concept of this plane being a backup interceptor, as sometimes it will feel as though it's lacking the speed to chase down the foe in a significant period of time. Alternatively, being able to chase after an enemy fighter or interceptor that's going after one of your friendly bombers. It will get there, but perhaps it'll be just a little bit too late before the job has been done and your friendly bomber has fallen out of the sky. Hence the backup nature, and that's exhibited in the straight line acceleration of this plane. But where this straight line acceleration works very well is in the fact that you can get into your idle speed range at 275 to 475 km an hour with no issue whatsoever. And because it's such a wide ideal speed range at which point all the control surfaces will be working at their maximum, you can feel confident to literally snap out of a small dive in this plane and go straight into a turn fight, and knowing that the energy retention of this plane allows you to keep all your speed, your control surfaces will still be responding very well, as we mentioned previously, because their lockup thresholds are above 475 km an hour, the earliest one is at 550 km an hour on the elevator, so you have no issue in just switching tactics on the fly. Now of course you do have the issue, with your energy retention being so strong in the horizontal and the vertical, 
you don't always have the ability to bleed off the energy just by instantly going into a turn. And this can lead you to overshooting the target or alternatively crashing into the back of the target because you get too close. So that's something you do need to be careful of and sometimes you need to manage your energy more carefully than other aircraft simply because the plane's not going to bleed the energy itself at the rate you may anticipate. And we're latching onto the back of the MiG-315 here, but we're being a bit off put by the fact we've got multiple allies also converging on them. The number of enemies in the sky is rather low at this point. Unfortunately, we're taking out the game right at the maximum peak of the enemy's performance by the looks of things. So we broke off there to make sure we wouldn't crash into any friendlies or upset our friendlies by shooting at them. Whilst team damage not active, it's not nice to shoot at allies and vice versa, at least in my opinion. But nonetheless, that's one thing to keep in mind is that the energy retention of this plane is so strong in all aspects apart of the straight line, as we mentioned previously, that you are going to have that difficulty of sometimes of bleeding off the energy when you're first flying this plane. It really did catch me by surprise. But other items to note, well, we've talked about the maximum altitude limits, we talked about the fact there's no real bottom or lowest altitude limit, you can fly all the way down to ground level and still get the most out of this plane. One comparison point would be, at a battery to the 2.3 you also have the Italian MC202. How do the two planes compare? Well, I would argue that this is the better turn fighter, whereas the MC202 with the same armament makes the better hit and run fighter because that has the greater sense of speed, but it's also played by the issue on its rudder, where the rudder is going to become rather unstable when used heavily in the turn fight, which causes the MC202 to lean more towards boom and zoom and hit and run style attacks. And do keep in mind, because it's just that tiny bit faster, it's one of those planes you can't necessarily get away from. But the two planes are rather evenly matched, the turn circle of this plane is tighter and over time you'll gain the advantage, but much like the historical counterpart, the two planes are going to come up with some rather favourable and enjoyable engagements against one another. Now as we make our way towards the lag free, it's diving down our allies in the centre of the map, hitting right into a swarm of bees, and our little bees are going to sting that lag free out of the sky. So unfortunately we're not going to be able to get them, perhaps we'll go after that F3F-2 or the Key 43 although they're going some friendly bombers, and we're just giving them time to build up some altitude and potentially come charging after us. We're not going to rush in there. Particularly with regards to the fact that's a biplane, the F3F, which means it's going to be out to turn us naturally, and the Key 43's also got a slightly tighter turn circle on our own plane, and we don't want to get caught out by that. We now start to make our way over. The game's going to be coming to an end shortly, and the last thing we're going to try and do is head on the Key 43 and see how that works, because we do have the nose-mounted machine guns, which can score some hits on the target's engine if we are accurate of our aim. And as we're making our way over, the only other thing to notice, you've got plentiful ammunition. As we can see, 1,200 rounds with the lower caliber machine guns, 700 rounds with the 12.7s, meaning that reloads are not going to exactly be a problem. The game comes to its end, and it's time for us to take a look at the post-game stats. By primarily deploying our RE 2001 Series 1 in the turn fighting role, we're able to pick up 6 kills and a single assist, netting us 16,571 silver lions and 4,222 research points. When facing the RE 2001 Series 1 in a one-on-one -on -one engagement, it is difficult for me to recommend a certain approach to defeating this aircraft due to its strong all-round performance. Without doubt there will be some planes which can outperform it in a turn fight, for example the Hurricane Mark IIb and the A6M2-N, due to their naturally tighter turn circles. Meanwhile at the other end, there will be some which can outrun this plane in a straight line and or in a dive thanks to their superior sense of speed, thereby being able to use hit and run tactics to their advantage. For example the Typhoon Mark IIa or the MiG-315BK. These scenarios become more commonplace when the RE-2001 C1 is the top and bottom battery rating aircraft in a given match respectively. In the case of the former, the plane can face a variety of slower but much tighter turning biplanes, including the I-15Biz and the Gladiator Mark II, whereas in the latter its opponents, including the P-38E and the MB-157, become much faster as a whole and can more easily choose when to engage this plane. As a result, defeating the RE-2001 Su-1 will be a highly situational concept, with the key factors being the plane you are flying and the relative energy states of your plane and the RE-2001. However, one general means of undermining the potency of this aircraft will be using a head-on pass to initiate the engagement. Reason being, the firepower available to the RE-2001 C1 is rather limited overall, but more so in the head-on as the plane can only rely on its nose-mounted 12.7mm machine guns in order to deal significant damage, especially at the longer ranges, i.e. out to 1.2km, where head-ons typically start. The net result of this is that most planes can enter a head-on with the RE-2001 C1 with at least equal, if not superior, firepower available. 
aircraft armed with nose mounted cannon, for example, the Heinkel HE-112A0, the VG-33C1, or the Yak-1, or heavy machine guns, examples including the F2A-3 Buffalo or the Ki-61 Mark I Otsu, can tear the RE-2001 Su-1 apart with accurate fire. The same can be said for those with multiple wing mounted heavy machine guns, for example the P40E and the F4F-3, which have been set to distant convergence ranges of 600m+. plus. I Meanwhile mean, those planes with shorter range light machine guns, which are less suited to head-ons, will typically fall into the category of planes which can at least match the RE-2001 Su-1 to a turn circle, examples including the P-36 Seahawk, if not outperform it, examples including the I-16 Type 24. Hence, head-on attacks can be a great avenue for engaging this plane, in that you can either use the head-on to try and dispatch the plane from the sky, or to close the distance to engage it in a favourable turn fight. To wrap up, let's first recap the strengths and weaknesses of the RE-2001 Serie 1. Its main strengths are number 1. All-round performance With its good turn circle, above average control surfaces, strong climb rate and great energy retention in both the vertical and horizontal, the RE-2001 Su-1 is not restrictive in the types of tactics, i.e. boom and zoom, stall fighting, turn fighting, etc. its pilot can deploy to deal with a given threat. Number 2. Wide idle speed range Situated between 275 and 475 km an hour, the width of this range means it will be difficult for the plane to enter an engagement, whereas outside of this range unless in exceptional circumstances, for example an extreme dive or coming out of a stall. This guarantees the plane will enter the engagement with maximum performance available. And number three, comfortable stall. Stalling this plane is not an issue thanks to its strong stall recovery. Upon stalling at 120 km an hour, the plane's nose will gradually drop and its speed will only need to be raised to 195 km an hour before its control surfaces are regained. As a result, this makes the RE2001 Serie 1 a difficult plane to successfully stall out for a clean strike. As for its key weaknesses, number one, straight line energy retention. When coming out of a dive, the RE2001 Su-1 will only start to hold on to its speed in level flight at 495 km an hour. Whilst this is superior to lower battery rate in opposition, this can be matched if not surpassed by a large portion of equal and a higher battery rate in opposition, forcing you to engage those right on your 6. And number 2, Armament Found Wanting. The British fat machine guns of this plane demand extended time and target and accuracy in order to deal major damage. This can be frustrating, especially when using boom and zoom tactics with this plane, as setting up the perfect shot on target may merely lead to hits rather than critical damage or a clean kill. As for my final opinion of the aircraft, the RE-2001 Serie 1 is a highly enjoyable fighter, which is a considerable step up from its predecessor. Whereas the RE-2000 Serie 1 was an easy going turn fighter, its successor proceeds to retain the strength and then add to it thanks to the addition of the Alfa Romeo RA-1000 engine giving the plane a much greater sense of speed and climb rate. The only downside to this approach is that the plane's armament will feel weak compared to its competitors, demanding perseverance to get the most out of it. Yet, upon looking past this issue, one cannot help but smile at the fun that can be had in flying the Falco 2. With that, that is all I've got time for today. For my next review in two weeks' time, i.e. Sunday the 10th of March 2019, I intend to review either number 1, the SM91, a tier 4 battery rating 3.7 Italian attacker, or number 2, the F2A-1 Buffalo, a tier 1 battery rating 2.0 American fighter. Which of these two aircraft I review is entirely up to you. You can cast your vote by using the hyperlink in the description of this video. Polling will close at 1200 hours GMT on Sunday the 3rd of March 2019. But as always, I've been TX141. If you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, as always, take care and good luck in the skies.